looking at the first chapter of James. It is our book of study on Sunday. And we're looking at verses, well, we'll go through five through eight. Remember this section that he's, that James is in his, actually his book has started, is, remember it's being addressed to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad in verse one. And his subject that he opens with is um, the church, because of that, is in undeserved suffering. Uh, They're under prolonged undeserved suffering. And they're really struggling with the fact that it's prolonged. They're not struggling with the fact that they've heard this doctrine. They're not struggling with the fact that they believe this doctrine. They're struggling with the application of that doctrine of undeserved suffering in a prolonged period of suffering. It is, uh, they are, at, and, and, and it's being revved up. They're under persecution, and what started out with ostracizing, criticizing, then they began being taken to court and became the legal system went after the Christians. Then, and the Christians didn't, rec- didn't recant. And so they began to persecute them unbelievably. And we'll see that. We'll see it. And James is writing to this group of people. This thing started out with the murder of Christ on the cross, as far as the human standpoint of it. And after that, they just wrapped it up. And over the next 15 years period, the church is going to go through enormous suffering. And James is the pastor of that group of people. He's the pastor of the church, uh, of the, the pivot group that developed after Pentecost, and he's with that group, struggling with them in the disbursement. And when he writes his book, we're um, somewhere around 45, 46, 47 in that period. So we're about 15 years out from the crucifixion of Christ, which from a social standpoint was murder. They murdered him. They didn't give him fair due process legally. And... Uh, So James is writing to this group, and he starts right out writing to them, trying to get them, trying to instruct them how to deal with this prolonged period of suffering and a period that has just gathered steam against them. Uh, And one of those that gathered steam against them was Saul of Tarsus that we're very familiar with. Uh, I mean, when he came into the scene, he really wrenched it up good on them. And uh, put them in prison, uh, confiscated their properties. Uh, those who wouldn't recant, then he put in jail or killed or whatever. I mean, he, and so this is the group of people that James is writing this group of believers. And you remember it started out in verses 2, 3, and 4, where he's giving them encouragement about it. And then when we get to, when we get to verse 5, he now talks about the struggle they're having. He talks about, look, I know you're in undeserved suffering. Uh, count it all joy. He starts with that. You would think he might have stopped with that or closed with it, but he started with it. That was his lead. And the title sermon was count it all joy. And, and he tells you uh, what kind of suffering they're going through. He doesn't have to describe it because they're in it. But he, he, he deals with various types uh, of, of suffering that's involved in this thing in the verses 2, 3, and 4. And he tells them what state of mind they ought to be in when he says, count it all joy in verse 2, when you fall into vi- various or uh, encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patient endurance. Remember that? Hupamunae. And let patient endurance have its perfect results. Only way that can happen is you have to have your faith completely in dependency on God. It's not going to work if you don't. 
let it have its perfect work. Let it, let it, let God have his perfect work in your life because he works all things together for good that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Then he comes to verses 5 through 8, and now he deals with the struggle they're having within their faith system. We call it the faith cycle. He says, but if any of you lack wisdom, remember wisdom, this is important now. Wisdom means the practical application of the truth you understand and believe, getting it practically out into human experience. When, the, when you do that, it becomes wisdom. When you run the whole faith cycle and you, you come to the place of completion and it gets done, you've got wisdom. You've gained wisdom. And wisdom is the high motivator in the Christian life. It's not knowledge, it's wisdom. Now, you can't get wisdom without knowledge, but knowledge is on the hearing, believing side. Wisdom comes from the application, completion side. And when you lack that, and that's where they were, when you lack that, then you can pray to God for it because that's his desire that you, you know, 2 Peter 3.18, it's his desire that, that we grow in knowledge and faith. Faith is the key that takes you from knowledge through the faith system and the application of it. It brings you into wisdom because you see how the word of God is not just an intelligent system. It's a practical system. It's a life you learn it to live it. And so, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God a prayer system who gives to all men, and this is a very positive idea, who gives to all men generously and without reproach. He's not, be going, to, he's not going to be critical that you're struggling with it. it the fact, there are times in our life when we just struggle with some things. It's not necessarily a bad decision. Not necessarily a bad decision at the point everything worked, but there's there's situations where and we we feel like we're not holding our end of the deal up or something. And we and I tell you I tell you what he doesn't do is what you do to yourself. You need to stop it. And that's you you become self critical. You 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 without reproach you become the you become your worst enemy, as they say. You beat yourself up. Nobody has to come around, knock on the door, and say, "Hey, I want to beat you up for the way you've been living." But you do it to yourself. It's called the conscience, and 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 he calls it a weak one, not a strong one. And so, but I'm, what I'm saying to you, you shouldn't do it to yourself because God don't do it. God doesn't do this to you. You shouldn't do it to yourself. Uh, he doesn't do that. Um, and it will be given to the person. You ask for wisdom, God will gladly give it to you, but what it is is a practical exercise of what you've heard, believe, and now are trying to walk out in your life. You're stumbling a bit, little bit in your walking. You're staggering, you know, staggerly. That's one of you. You're staggerly a little bit. And so, and, and then he comes to verse 6, which is really important. As this is what was really getting him. This was what was really getting this group of people in prolonged periods of suffering. Listen, in verse 6, but let him ask in faith. Now watch what he's going to say, without doubting. See, their problem wasn't fear, which was amazing to me. It was doubt. Now both, both are are bugger boos. But their problem was doubt. And doubt about what? Doubt that the father would, would be able to hold his end of the bargain. Come on now. Let him ask in faith without any doubting for the one who doubts, and then he illustrates it, is like a surf of a raging sea, and if it's not under control, it becomes, I said, a tsunami. It, and, what, and I said that because it becomes destructive in your life. Because your under, undeserved suffering is not going to let up because the point is to get through it and grow from it. And it, it could be it has nothing to do with your undeserved suffering. When you look out the window, it could be, it could be cultural it could be national, right? In this case, the, the nation was after him, right? I mean, he had, 
I mean, the Jews were after him. Rome didn't have a chance till later. Then Rome will get after him. And listen, the church has always done well when the nation doesn't want to give them the freedom to preach the truth of the word of God. The church has always went ahead and preached the word of God and took the hit for it. And, and listen, the church was always better for it. We sat here today because martyrs, martyrs took the word of God. Martyrs took the word of God and never recanted in their faith in Jesus Christ. They couldn't be bought. They couldn't be murdered. They couldn't silence the church of Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody. Now listen, they always do the same system. They, first of all, they become critical of you. Then they, they attack you legally. Then they confiscate. Then they do it legislative. They confiscate. And then they persecute you to the nth of your life. And if that doesn't work, if you won't shut your mouth, then they take your head off. And the church always grows because God is in control of that. They've already killed the head of the church. The body lives forever because the head has been raised from the dead. You're not getting the point. We live in such a culture. The first thing they do, they, they bully you. Then the second thing they do, they bring legal. They bring it legal against you. And at our place, they will change constitutions, or if they can't change the constitution, they'll change it down in the lower courts. Tell me you don't see this. And when none of that works, and it will not work, except to the weak church, it will not work, then they persecute you. After they've confiscated everything and you still are there, living in a tent or on the street, then they, then they go to killing you. That's hard to believe, isn't it? It should not be if you're over, if you're over 50. If you're over 50, you've seen America and the South take a real whipping, the church. Well, anyhow, legally. Legally. Well, that's verse 6. Verse 7. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. What? If you ask in faith without doubting, you get it. But if you doubt, you don't. Why? Listen to me. This is important. Shuts down the faith system. It shuts the faith cycle down. Here's verse 8. Being a double-minded man, there he is. He's got the faith to walk it, but he's got doubt that shuts it down. That's a double-minded man. You do see that. It's a double-minded man. A double-minded man. And what? He's unstable in all of his ways. When you shut the faith system down, it, it destabilizes you. You're unstable in all of your ways, not just some of them. The system shut down. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into the study. That's reading it. Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way today by automobile and the Internet and for our classroom etiquette. We pause a moment to acknowledge the importance of spirituality versus carnality. Carnality is the evidence of personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins or sins of the, of the tongue or overt sins. That's carnality. Identifying that is very important to become spiritual. The Holy Spirit has not left us. We've left him. And so we pray, Father, that you would instruct us through 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It restores us to 1 John 1, 5, fellowship. And, and it's a principle of, of sanctification. It's a principle of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is the key to understanding the truth of the Word of God, not, not only in just learning it, but also in living it, walking it out, walking by the Spirit and not the flesh. 
So I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the double-minded believer. Show it to us, Father. May we never be that person. May we be the single-minded, not double-minded, single-minded believer in the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, <clears throat> undeserved suffering um, should not come to a shock to any believer because of Philippians 129. Now, there's some typos in, in that, and you'll find them as you go through it. Uh, I didn't notice them until this morning. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. That's the way it should be translated, as you well know in your Bible. So what does it tell you? He said, on the, here, here is the Christian life. You've, it's been granted you, for you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that grant has been given to you, and suffering comes with it. It's not just suffering. Don't miss this now. Undeserved suffering means you're suffering for the sake of Christ. It's not because you're making bad decisions. That's not undeserved suffering. It's not divine discipline. That's not undeserved. Undeserved is suffering for the sake of Christ. And nobody will know it better than you. Okay? It won't be a hard choice. Undeserved suffering didn't come as a shock because of Philippians 129 anymore. It should come to you. But what did come as a shock to this group of people, they had good Bible teachers. What came as a shock to them was the prolonged suffering period, a prolonged period of suffering that kept getting extreme, severe. And... If you've ever been in a situation of prolonged suffering, then listen, not only does it affect the person going through it, but it affects those people that are going through it with them. And it can be an enormous struggle sometimes. And you need to understand that this is what this is about. And this, listen... It goes to every generation. It doesn't mean you have to be persecuted. There are a variety of different trials under undeserved suffering. <clears throat> they are going under persecution, uh, suffering. They're being, it is so severe that they're running for their lives. And it has to get pretty severe when you give up everything you have worked for all your life, even your family, and go like, we can't, take, we, we can't stay here any longer. We've got to go. It's called being dispersed abroad. And listen, you know what they did? They became the first great missionaries. These people went out preaching the word of God. They didn't just go run and hide. They ran out to other places preaching the word of God. Following the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, persecution against the church is seen clearly in Acts 4. When you go later to your Bible and you look at Acts 4, you begin to see what started at, as, the, as the Romans and the Jewish people prompting Rome's help murdered Jesus Christ. Now, we understand the divine viewpoint, and I'm just approaching it from the human standpoint. They murdered him. They gave, gave no, no due process. Even the top people said, this man is innocent, and yet they murdered him. That's called murder. Well, in Acts 4, by the time we get to Acts 4, they are now, they are now moving against the church. Now, they've been moving, but they, they're, they're, they've got set their second wind. I mean, it didn't work out well for him. Christ, he got raised from the dead. Now they got a bigger problem than they had before because they can't kill him again. Can't find him, and then pff, he's gone. So they're going to persecute the believers, their followers. And so by, by four, the, the enemy has gotten, the, the, the state has gotten, the Jewish state has gotten their second wind, and Acts 4, they're out after him again. 
And so they're, they're, they're confiscating property. They're doing all kinds of things. They're, they're, if you had a job, you don't have it anymore. If you're a believer, you, if you're a Christian, you don't get in. And this is what's going on. It became severe and prolonged throughout the book of Acts. That's often missed in this study of the book of Acts. By the time we get to Acts, the seventh chapter, they murder Stephen. He, he, he was one of the top people. He's one of the seven guys, as you open this, as you open up the seventh chapter, he's one of the seven guys that was one of the top leadership. And they murdered him. They, they, they get, get him in Acts 7. James, the brother of John, not the writer of this book, but James, the brother of John, was murdered in Acts 12. They murdered him in Acts 12. They're going after leaders. Can you see that? They're going out after the top leaders. They're finding all the guys that are in top leadership, and they're taking them out. And they, listen, <laughs> just like the American military, the U.S. military, they're so designed, you can take the top people out, you still have a fighting force. You have to get down to one man who can't lead another because they're built in such a way that you can go down the chain down to you get down to, you have to get down to one because they're going to lead a fight. The church was the same way. You know why? Because it couldn't get to head. The head was still operational. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. And he just kept his guys all informed all the way down the pike. Listen, they're not the first nation that's ever tried to kill the church to destroy it. If you read, if you, it, listen, you ought to get Kniep one time just to do a panoramic view and show you the different nations that tried to take out the church. They finally learned they should cooperate with it, and that's the worst thing that happened to the church. When they put them under one umbrella, they don't really got screwy. But, it, but now you got James. It occurred about the time of the writing when they killed James. When we get to Acts 12, we are now at about the time that James has put out his book, this circular book because everybody is in deep trouble. And James, this is the time of the writing of James' book and Paul's first missionary trip out. We're in, the late, we're in the late 40s. I tell you that because, listen, when you look at the history of this thing, we're in about a 15-year period all this has gone on. 15 years. I got jackets in my closet that old that I still wear. I wouldn't give them up for anything. I'm waiting for them to become an antique. I can sell them and get my money back. But listen, between Jesus Christ and where we are when James goes down and Paul goes on his first missionary trip, it's about 15 years. This is I mean, this, they have really gotten after him. And this is what James, when, when we're reading James, the book of James, this is who he's writing to. This is the condition of the church that James is writing to. He's the pastor of the Jerusalem church and, and the Jewish people that have been converted to Christ. And they've gone through it. I mean, I, I, I sat sometimes in my office and I'm reading this stuff and my, I can't even wrap my brain around what these guys were going through. You'd have, to, you'd have to know more about the Holocaust and things of that nature to understand this. These people were going through it. And so James writes to encourage them to keep the fight. You know, they all did. did and all the guys, listen, all the way down the ranks, Paul says, you know, Fight the good fight, finish the course, keep the faith. You know what it was about? It was about persecution. I mean, it's hard to keep the church in line in peacetime. I think we do better when things are tough. 
than when things are good. Maybe it's just human nature. I don't know. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be any nature in the church. Let me talk about four things this morning. Let me talk about four things about the double-minded believer. What he's worried about is their double-mindedness makes them ineffective. Makes them ineffective in their own life, makes them effective in the, ineffective in the world. These believers were struggling with a faith cycle during the period of prolonged, severe persecution, undeserved suffering. Listen, our undeserved suffering may not be persecution, but if it's prolonged, you're still going to have this problem in dealing with it. Prolonged periods of suffering. It can really get to you. I mean, I've ministered over many years with people that have gone through long, prolonged, prolonged anything. A prolonged anything that involves suffering is difficult. And so this book is a wonderful book for you. James referred to it, refers to what their people are going through as, as um, when you encounter various trials in the English. I don't know that really, really tells you the story. So I'm trying to give you a background to the story when he says this because what they were going through was unbelievable. They were falling in. They were falling in like quicksand. It, it, they, couldn't get, they couldn't get ahead of it. The persecution was just unbelievable. You couldn't get ahead of it. You couldn't catch your breath. The, the more you ran and the harder you ran, the faster they came. And I just, you just need to know that because there are times in your prolonged suffering where you just think, Is there, will there not be a, a new day for me? Will, it, will there not be a point where I can just take, sit down and take a deep breath? I mean, this book is for you. This book is for you. So when you, he's referring to those times when you, when you encounter various trials and then they become prolonged, he says, knowing that the testing of your faith is beneficial to your life. I mean, you just got to know that promise from God that is beneficial. And sometimes it's really difficult. You know, you, you got a great athlete in your family, and all of a sudden, no, no cause of their own, they're in a serious accident of some sort, and, and uh, they're paralegic. And, and they're like 16. And they go through all the testing. They send them to the finest places, and they tell them the same thing. Now, listen, this is it. And it's amazing what they consider a little miracle when this person can do the, some of the least simplest things, and they, everybody goes like, oh. I mean, they're, they're, how, do you, how, do you, how do you work your way out of that? And I've pastored people like that, and it's really difficult. It's really difficult. It's to get them into a mindset of ministry and positiveness that's beyond their suffering. And that's what James is trying to do. This is exactly. They were struggling. Listen, look at your faith cycle. See it on the bottom of your page? Here's what I want you to do. Take a line and, and draw a line, you know, this way, you know, we do this off the t all the time, this way. Separate hearing and believing, draw a line and separate hearing and believing from applying and completing. Just draw a line through there. And on, on the, the hearing and believing side, put learning. And on the applying and completing side, put living. Because we learn the word of God to live it. Now, they're struggling with doubt, Right? It's not fear that it's doubt. So see under the line on the side of the application completion side, underneath that line on that side, write the word doubt. Because where the failure here didn't come from hearing the doctrine of undeserved suffering. It didn't come from believing the doctrine of, un of undeserved suffering. It came from applying it. 
And the reason was the prolonged, the prolonged, And the truth of the matter is, it's going to be all your life. And if it's not what you're in now, it'll be something else. Because you live in the devil's world. And God is going to work things in your life to accelerate your spiritual growth. And these are all good things that are going on in your life. You got to believe that. All things, you got to believe Romans 8 28. You can't just state it. You got to believe it. God works, God works all things together for God. God does that. It's not you, it's God does this. You got to remember those things. Doubt comes in, and it's doubt. Doubt is not about the suffering. I got that down. Doubt is not about the word of God. I got that down. Doubt is about when am I going to get relief? Where are you, God? Where are you, God? You, you, know, you know who was in a prolonged period of suffering that tells us a great deal about all that and the inner struggle that these people were having in a prolonged suffering? Listen, this could be applied if you're in it or it could be applied if you're, if you're, if you're a caregiver in this period with other people who are going through prolonged periods of Job, Job, if you want to know the inner working and struggle and doubt, study the book of Job. There were some doctrines in his life that he was solid on. There were other doctrines dealing with suffering and all that that he was just wishy-washy on. He just couldn't get a handle on it because God... Listen, unless he gets down to why did you, why was I even born? See, when things are going good, you say, oh, God, you, I'm thankful that I was born in the time I was born. I'm thankful that family I was born. When things are going bad, oh, God, why did I have that family? Oh, God, why did I have that? Oh, God, yeah. See, Job went through all that, didn't he? He questioned, he said, listen, why, I'd have been better off stillbirth, you know, death, stillbirth death. I mean, And he got full of all kinds of doubts. And so you can see that. So when you go in there, look, here's where, here's where the rubber hits the pavement in the walking. You know, this, when it says applying, that's walk by, that's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. That's walk by faith, not by sight. Sight's another view other than what God says, right? It's another view. It's not a bad view, maybe, but it's not, the, it's not the view you should be having where you are. I mean, you could get 10 people that don't know the word of God. They say, well, I think you're right on the, I think you're right on the money, what you're saying. But then you hold the word of God up to the word of God says, mm-mm. <laughs> Applying walk, peripateo. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, the word walk is peripateo. And it's a reference, no matter what your life is, no matter what your situation is, you always walk it out in faith. You keep the faith, baby. You keep the faith. You run the course. You fight the fight. You keep the faith. You know, you know why that's on the end? Because it's important to everything. Fighting the good fight. Keep the faith. Oh, yeah, you got knocked down three times, get back up three times. And let's see how this thing comes out. It's who's on, if it's whether or not you're still in the fight. Fight the good fight. Didn't say you had to win. Said you had to fight the good fight. Didn't say you had to win the course. Said you had to run it. But the one thing you have to do is keep the faith. Stay on your feet. Stay in the fight. Stay on your feet. Stay in the race. How do I do that? Keep the faith. And sometimes keeping the faith is all you got. These people, all they had, they took everything else away they could depend on except God. And keep the faith is dependent on God. God promised it, he'll do it. But he'll do it in his time. And it'll be good for you when it comes. And it'll be good for you that it didn't come before it came. <laughs> did I just confuse myself or did I confuse you? Many of you grew up under the colonel's teaching 
like I did. And he used a phrase called the faith rest technique. Let me show you where you put it. You put it on the side of application completion. That's where faith rest technique goes. Faith rest technique. You know what that technique is? Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Fight the fight, but keep the faith. It's the only thing to keep you in the fight. Get knocked down. Get up. Get knocked down. Get up. I mean, could you imagine going a 13 round and every round they knocked you down? I mean, at some place, wouldn't you think I'm just going to... At some point, don't you think the guy on the outside would be thinking about... Don't you think your coach might think about throwing the, uh, the white towel in? If you got knocked down every round, I mean, boom, on the canvas, you get out the bell. Thank God for a bell. Second round, boom, down. Ding, ding. Oh, thank God for a bell. And the only thing you look forward to every round is the bell. And you are still on your feet in the 13th round. And God says you won the fight. Think about that. Not the world. The world calls you a loser. God calls you a winner. <laughs> you know why he calls you a winner? Because you got back on your feet and kept the faith. And that's a winner. No matter what the world tells you, that's a winner. And let me tell you, by the time the 13th round comes and this guy staggers to his feet and puts his paws up, hoping he can hold them up there and not take such a beating, by the 13th round, he's won the audience. Do you know that? The guy who wins has not got the audience. The guy who gets up and they go like, my God, how could he do that? And he goes, it is because of my God I can do that. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And let me tell you, by the end of the fight, the guy who climbs up with courage and tenacity, who keeps the faith, has won the crowd. That's how the church of Jesus Christ has existed. That's how you win your family. That's how you win your neighbors. That's how you win the people who you work around. They see your faith, the tenacity. Nothing gets it. I climb back on my feet and I go that round because I am credited with a win if I'm still on my feet. Does that make sense to you? Does that sound like a, a bunch of baloney? Well, let me tell you, that's the Christian church. And let me tell you, these people are these people. They've got knocked down every round and got back up on their feet. And God says, God, there's my man. There's my man. I know you're listening to a bell. I know it. But I'm giving you just a short breather to get back on your feet. It takes God. It takes God. The Bible gives you faith. God gives you the courage to carry it out in your life. God. Carry my mail, son. Carry my mail. Carry my mail out into your life. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I will crown you victor. Not the way the world crowns you. I will crown you a victor because you've kept the faith. When Christ comes back, you know what he's looking for? He's looking for the guy who can go 13 rounds and still get on his, get on his feet. A guy who has kept the faith. And he's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful, faithful, faithful servant. Whoa. Not looking to win the bouts in the world. I'm looking to stand on my feet. Still be standing when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. With my head held high, no matter how beating the world has given me. 
Because I know I can do all things through Christ. I know that. I know that. Not just some things. I can do all things. Here's the second point. The faith cycle was broken by doubt. I'm to walk by faith. Doubt broke it. This is a war. Listen, the double-minded, one, one mind is on faith, the other is on doubt. The faith that's on, the, the mind, the part of the mind that's on faith is on God. And the part that's on doubt is not. It's on me. I can't take it one more day. Then give that day to Jesus. I can't take it one more day. Give it to Jesus. I can't take one more minute. Give it to Jesus. It's amazing how when you give it to Jesus, you can make one more minute before you couldn't. It's amazing how you can make the next day when you give it to Jesus. How you couldn't if you didn't. The faith cycle is broken by doubt. Broken by doubt. He says, ask in faith without doubting because doubt is a destructive force in your life. That was in verse 6. In verse 6, he says it twice, doesn't he? Don't doubt because doubt is a destructive force, didn't he? Right? Keep your faith. Don't doubt. Doubt's a destructive force like, like the surf, Right? that pushes a raging sea of destruction in your life. Doubt is in conflict with the application completion, faith rest side of the faith cycle. I mean, sometimes... Sometimes it's hard to get up on that next round. I mean, sometimes you, you're on your knees on the mat. You're on your knees. And you think to yourself, you know what? I got to just quit. My life is pretty loaded up. And you think, you know what? I don't know what I need this in my life. I could just stay here. I could stay here right on my knees and I stand on my feet. I could sit right here. And not take any more whipping. But you know what? You signed up for 13. This is only six. You signed up for 13. Oh, yeah. Payday is the same. The honor isn't. The honor within your soul is not the same. The honor within yourself. The guy you have to look in the mirror. The old coach that caused you to think more and better of how you could do things than any, anything you'd ever, you, you hear his voice in the back and say, get up, son. You're a winner if you stay and you're a loser if you, if you stay. Let me tell you who that coach is in your life. It's Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit always telling you, I'll give you the strength. You stand up. I can't, I can't make you stand up, son. If you stand up, I'll give you the strength to go another round. Boy, I'm going to tell you, I hope you need this. The prolonged period of suffering has caused some believers to doubt the promises of God. When you doubt the promises, you doubt the character of the person who gave it. James has encouraged them in the midst of unbelievable suffering to be single-minded, not double-minded. Single-minded is walk faith out, walk it out, live by faith Never give up on faith. When you do, you give up on God, and God is the only thing that can get you from day to day. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As a congregational member of doctrinal studies, do you know whose favorite verse that is? Without doubt, Jeannie Wilson.
may be the only Bible verse that she's got memorized. I don't know. But I can tell you what, if you ask her a favorite verse, she'll give it to you right up straight. And if there's anybody that's lived it, it's her. She's a walking encouragement in my life. Jeannie Wilson. She'll look you dead in the eye and tell you that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And listen, she walks it out as an invalid. She walks by faith. I said to David one time, he was complaining because he can't get around. I said, David, <laughs> you don't walk by crutches. You walk by faith. You know, it is the truth, isn't it? You don't walk by crutches. You never let the crutch become a disabler. I said, you got the same two feet spiritually that I have. You can walk by faith, son. You can walk by faith. Don't let the devil tell you anything else. You don't walk by crutches. You walk by faith. Where in the Bible does it say you walk by crutches? Don't let the devil lie to you. Get back on your feet spiritually. You sit there and doubt this stuff and, oh, woe is me, and you get in that self-pity stuff. Don't do that. There's enough... There's enough other opportunities to go, whoa, it's me. <laughs> Don't go there. Gee whiz. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11, 3. I am afraid. I am afraid, least as the serpent deceived Eve. By his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity, which is the single-mindedness of Christ. That word simplicity, that's what that means. And purity of devotion to Christ. You know what Eve, you know, you know what Eve got? You know what her fall was over? Double mindedness. You know it and I know it. Her double mindedness. Don't always have to be doubt, but it's always about double mindedness. I mean, you're sure to bankrupt as soon as you go double minded on an issue. Well, yes, I, the Bible is a good little book, and I, 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 uh, 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 and I know faith, but uh, uh, uh. what are you talking about? Listen, you, listen, when you're double-minded, you're double-tongued. And sometimes you can tell by the way they talk whether they're double-minded. James instructs those suffering in their faith under undeserved suffering to pray for wisdom, which is the application side of the faith cycle. The application completion side is what he asked him to pray for. Jane warns him. James warns him. He instructs him to pray for wisdom in faith without doubting. He gives him a warning. Note what's promised him. Well, notice what's promised the suffering believer. God will give, God will give generously and without reproach, and it will be given to you. That's a promise. That's a good day. The good day is in God. It's not in the affairs of your life. Note the divine warning given to the suffering believing. Ask in faith without doubting. Doubt is destructive. And listen to what he says in verse 7. For that man ought not to expect Oyomai is an interesting word because <clears throat> it deals with a false expectation. A false expectation. A f for the man ought not. That's a false expectation, right? You see the word not? The word oyomai is the word for expectation. You see, and listen, that's what leads to double-mindedness. He ought not to expect when we studied the book of Job, we found a formula. And this formula, James found, and he just said it. And the formula is this. A false assumption leads to a false interpretation that leads to a false expectation. That's oyomai. That leads to a false application, a breakdown in the faith cycle on the application completion side. 
And so James calls it double-mindedness, and double-mindedness takes away counted all joy. Now, William tells me, William tells me that you have to hear something like this. How many times, William? Ten times. No, sir, buddy. I want you to get it. But I tell you, that lesson like this, you have to hear it more than once. Let us pray. Then the men will take the offering. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for what the Word of God has taught us today about suffering. It touches every life. It touches it in dramatic ways at different times to different people. Sometimes it's direct. Sometimes it's indirect. It's with people we love and are connected with, people in our church, people in our family. But, you know, it don't matter. We have to fight the good fight. Sometimes down on our knees, we got to get back up and walk it out. In, the, in human realms, they talk, they talk about walking it off. <laughs> we call it walking it out. Keep the faith. Run the ways. Don't matter if you win. It matters if you finish. Keep the faith. Don't doubt. Don't doubt. Doubt brings inner destructiveness to the spiritual life. Don't fear. You can do all things through Christ. What God has promised, he's able to perform. These are all promises given to us, Father, that we hold dear to our hearts as we walk this out in faith, in our own life, in our own journey. Encourage our hearts. This book of James will be revolutionary. It will be radical. It will be a radical book in the life of believers. I know it, Father, not only in our church, but all those who have the courage to come and listen and stay the journey with us through the book, this book will rationalize, rationalize their life, radicalize their life. I pray for that. I pray for that. I pray for that in our church here today, Father. It's okay to be on our knees, but being on our feet for another round is the answer. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.